it's kind of like when the smartphone came out and now we have it. It's your alarm clock. It's, it's how you order food. It's how you order Uber. It's, it's all those things. When you first got it, you didn't realize what you had. Right. And then all of a sudden the apps come along. And even this morning I utilized for our district leadership team, I, I built a GPT that just came out and open dev. So I, I built a GPT inside of open AI that was tailored to, I love John Hattie's work in instruction. So I, I built a GPT around that, that also loves the future of work and loves the future of technology and instruction. And so I was able to upload our new strategic plan that goes to the board tonight and then reflect on answers of what questions would you ask and all those things and had that in AI. And literally our assistant soup this morning, we were doing some whiteboarding and he goes, but we just write all those down up at the top so that we have the themes. And so starting with AI was even a, a component of our planning because, you know, it's, you start at 80%, right? 70, 80%. I feel like every task that I do, I start at 70 or 80%. How do you navigate change? It's a question we think about often and one that today's world expects us to be comfortable with. The challenge, however, is where do you begin and how do you develop the mindset and skills to be successful? You're listening to Designing Schools and I'm your host, Dr. Saba Kidwai, educator, researcher, and storyteller. Join me each week for stories and strategies that bridge the gap between research and practice as together we explore how might we design schools? A year ago, OpenAI broke records when within two months of releasing ChatGPT, they had over 100 million users. Today, this is the number of users that they have weekly. Now, if you've been a listener of the podcast, you know that AI is not a new topic. And that I've been talking with people like Eric Brynjolfsson, the director of the Stanford Digital Economy Lab and author of The Second Machine Age, alongside people like Seth Godin and Duncan Wardle about the skills and mindsets that we need to nurture as we witness the speed and scale of AI technology moving faster than anything we've ever experienced before. However, as impressive as these numbers might sound and for how quickly this technology is progressing, only a fraction of those 100 million weekly users are using the full capabilities of ChatGPT. What does that mean? Well, it means that very few people are paying for the capabilities beyond generating text. In fact, only an estimated 1% of people subscribe to ChatGPT. Now, if you're somebody who uses ChatGPT4, I'm sure this number shocks you just as much as it shocks me. But if you're somebody who isn't quite sure, what are the benefits of going to GPT4? Is it worth $20 a month? Here's one of the reasons why I believe it really matters. If you're a leader or you're responsible for strategy, implementation, training, or you're just someone who's wondering what generative AI technologies mean for your career, not playing around with the capabilities or not experimenting and exploring the capabilities of GPT-4 is like playing with an iPod, but tomorrow when you walk into an organization or just the world around you, everyone else is going to have a MacBook. Now, imagine building a strategy or planning your career with such limited scope. That's why today it is an absolute privilege to have Rob Dixon, the Chief Information Officer for Wichita Public Schools, the largest school district in Kansas, serving 50,000 students with 94 schools and programs and employing 10,000 professionals, here with us today to share how he went from thinking about generative AI as a consumer tool to designing a full strategy and implementation plan for what this looks like in an enterprise adoption for any organization. When I reflect back on a gap that I see, this is it. It truly is a mindset shift, an organizational shift to design for enterprise versus personal use. Now, Rob was hired in 2019 to lead the Department of Information Systems and Technology. He received the 2021 Orby Kansas City CIO of the Year Award in the public sector. He started and now oversees the district's virtual school. Education Imagine Academy, which achieved maximum capacity of 500 students in its first year and was awarded the distinction of 2021-2022 Microsoft Showcase School in its second year. 
Rob also works to consult numerous school districts. And I already know after this episode, you're going to want his contact information. So it is all there for you in the show notes. He also advises people with their strategic technology vision and implementation plans. A few noteworthy accomplishments include his previous district ranking among the top 10 digital districts in the nation four years consecutively. He led the first VBlock cloud data center installation in K-12 education and started the first virtual school in Nebraska's history. He was recently named 2014's 20 to Watch from NSBA for innovation and technology integration work. He was recognized as the top 30 technologists, transformers, and trailblazers by the Center for Digital Education in 2016. And in 2017, he won the Administrator PLN Award for Exemplary Leadership from ISTE. He is a 2022 National CIO of the Year finalist. This one hour is going to both allow you to play catch up, give you lots of great inspiration, ideas, and strategies, and even if you are somebody who is heavily involved in AI, is going to help you with so many ways to think beyond consumer use to really begin thinking about enterprise use. I start by asking Rob to share a story of how he saw people go from feeling skeptical about ChatGPT to realizing this was unlike anything they had ever seen before. You know, I think for myself, the first inclination that AI could make a huge difference, uh, I was in my small group with my district leadership team that composes the superintendent. Uh, communications director, assistant superintendents, all all the faculty. And uh, we're going through some qualitative answers. And this is like 4,000 teachers giving us feedback of kind of what they want to see over the next couple of years. And I was like, you know what? I could take that PDF document and I could give you insights. I could give you sentiment. And Wendy doesn't, our communications director doesn't have to do this. Like we could do this right now while everyone else, you know, she doesn't have to take the time. We can do this right this minute. So I had the whole room there and I uh, wirelessly displayed my screen and I, I brought up the PDF and I just had AI read it and it gave sentiment and a bunch of summaries, right? Of like, I want to say like eight bullet points. And what I loved, that room was like, whoa. There was like a silence, an eerie silence. And they were like, well, how did it come up with bullet point number two? And I was like, well, Let's ask it. How'd you come up with bullet point number two? And it just went through and grabbed some data. And what I loved about that was if a person went through all of those answers, the biases that come across, because that person and their previous experience would either reflect or in some way, shape or form shape the answers that they would have joined together in that sentiment. and. I think for myself, and that happened uh, way early on, probably 10 months ago, right? So this was like an April, March, April timeframe that I did that for them. And for the first time, I heard people that would never in their life, digital literacy level wise say, okay, I need you to teach me how to do that. I was like, yeah, I can teach it. It's real easy. And everyone has access to it. Rob shares an incredible example of how using ChatGPT not only saved him time, but also helped him accelerate the outcomes he was working towards. He also brings up another word we hear when talking about AI. As Rob shares, bias doesn't just exist in machines. It exists in humans as well. So I ask him how he balances this when using these tools for efficacy toward goals. Yeah, I would say just continue to ask questions and dig deeper. Have it respond with why it came up with the answers. And I think for myself, it, that's what I love. The ability to dig deep into data, whether it be in education, we're so quantitative, right? We, we have assessments and all these other things. But I really see this huge growth opportunity in qualitative work in getting authentic answers and getting authentic feedback that you can now just due to the nature of how fast AI is, you can turn those around and in a matter of moments. Like I think in the classroom, getting feedback, authentic feedback from students and being able to just wrap around that to tailor my instruction, that could happen instantly. And 
that couldn't have happened before. It's kind of like when the smartphone came out and now we have it. It's your alarm clock. It's, it's how you order food. It's how you order Uber. It's, it's all those things. When you first got it, you didn't realize what you had. Right. And then all of a sudden the apps come along. And even this morning I utilized for our district leadership team, I, I built a GPT that just came out and open dev. So I, I built a GPT inside of open AI that was tailored to, I love John Hattie's work in instruction. So I, I built a GPT around that, that also loves the future of work and loves the future of technology and instruction. And so I was able to upload our new strategic plan that goes to the board tonight and then reflect on answers of what questions would you ask and all those things and had that in AI. And literally our assistant soup this morning, we were doing some whiteboarding and he goes, but we just write all those down up at the top so that we have the themes. And so starting with AI was even a, a component of our planning because you start at 80%, right? 70, 80%. I feel like every task that I do, I start at 70 or 80%. Every task I do, I start at 70 to 80%. I want you to think about that for a moment. How does work change when we can start at 70% of the task being done versus zero? Now, I want you to imagine what that frees your time up to do if 70% of a task is done for you. What types of hopes and dreams are buried so deep within you that they're things that you don't even remember what they are? Well, now maybe we have an opportunity to rekindle them. As you go about your day, what are the things that you tell yourself you wish you could do? I ask Rob to share, what are the habits and mindsets that we should be developing so that we can use this technology beyond substitution to really rekindle our hopes and dreams and create new possibilities that just weren't possible before? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a massive time savings, right? Whenever you think about task management, or you think about what I could be doing, there's so many different aspects of acceleration with this. It's either like, if I want to start in this area here, even if I'm just brainstorming with myself, it would give me as a leader insights before I go into a meeting to know talking points, to have a depth of knowledge, because being a leader, you're not going to know everything. But if you have an insight before you walk in, it might make the conversation more meaningful. Even just going back to the data piece, understanding your people and the data that resides with them is important as well. And I think as a leader, I don't know where I would be at today if I hadn't been using AI over the last, I want to say just one year, right? I got access to ChatGBT in November of last year. So I was one of those first round people and it's grown on me you know, ever since, like I've written an AI policy and I've revised it now twice and it's not even approved by the board yet. And so we're, you know, we're going through the process, but the iteration of this thing is just so fast. I've never seen anything like it from a tool standpoint. Yeah, I, I would say, I feel like my first iPhone and my iPhone like just came out like a few months ago are not even that significantly different compared to what ChatGPT is in just the right. last couple of months. And so I love that. I would love to, I, say, I want to get into that AI policy in a minute, but before I do that, you know, here you are sharing from November, these are the different things you're seeing. These are the different things you're trying. You're looking at it from data analysis. Like you're doing all these things that, you know, the regular consumer who's paying for this as well could also do. What you're seeing these sort of like, we call them like signals of change. So you're seeing the power of the technology. What is it that allowed you to go from thinking about this from sort of that, I can do this as an individual to, we need to now think about this on an enterprise level and pursue and research those options. Because clearly you're going to be really well ahead when we think about the next upcoming school year because of this mindset. So tell us a little bit about that journey and what other people should be thinking about too. So I would say it really is trust, right? It starts with trust and building trust with the tool and understanding no matter what you're doing in that input, you are the subject matter expert and you have to validate, right? So I'd say very early on, did I have moments where it would hallucinate? Absolutely. Would it tell me just some crazy response that had nothing to do with the input that I gave it? Absolutely. But it's gotten way, way better. And 
to a trajectory that I don't even understand better. Right. So like, I think even the, the tools and everything else within the AI, whether it be real time search, internet searches across or updated data models that allow to see even, cause I think as a society, we're so attuned to having information right now and instantly that even the old models of, well, this was trained on 2020 data, so you're not going to get anything beyond there. Now it's like April of 2023, and it's even getting better in those instances. Because I think, honestly, post-COVID, I, I feel like the world has changed so much, right? And how we do things. My wife works in a remote work type setting, and uh, I don't remember the last time she went into the office or dressed up in regular office clothes kind of thing. So I do feel like so much the world has changed and we are embracing this tool like we never had before just because of an uncertainty in society has allowed us to have space, cognitive space to to take on a tool like this. And I think you're seeing growth because both consumers and industry and, and every industry sees this as something that is really dramatically affecting us. When I talk to my Kansas City, I'm in a Kansas City CIO group and they're across all industries, right? Some of them are technology, some of them are medical. Uh, One of my good friends, Chris Harper, is in medical and they're currently, everyone is creating their own GPT that's local, that's trained on their data. And from an industry standpoint, I really feel like that's where we're leaning to and beginning to understand uh, data science from a perspective is very different today. If I just know what questions to ask, what are the right questions to the data and let the model go ahead and figure out how to align that data. In enterprise society, we've been such great, great visualizers of data and we create these dashboards and then you have dashboards upon dashboards and and it's almost hard. It's almost like trying to traverse a website to find information anymore. But if I'm a person and I've got a certain digital literacy level, we know that people don't retire like they used to, right? We, they live longer. and So everybody in that technology spectrum comes to meet that technology at different times, right? Kindergartners today will only know AI. I really think in the end, it's just knowing what the right questions to ask. Listening to Rob reminds me of a quote my mentor often shared with me. It's from a book called Gravity's Rainbow. In the book, the author Thomas Pynchon says, if you get people asking the wrong questions, you never have to worry about the answers. As you've likely read about and as you're hearing today from Rob, AI integration and application is moving at a speed and scale unlike any previous technology. Individuals across every industry who are testing use cases, reflecting on the questions they should be asking, have a significant advantage over those who are thinking, well, we'll just wait and see what happens. Why? Because they're taking small steps. They're examining their own scenarios and context. They're building capacity and having conversations with teams across their organization as they test what does and doesn't work. This process and this method of design thinking allows them to gain valuable insights about what this technology means for them. I asked Rob what advice he would give to people who are saying, well, we'll just wait and see what happens. Yeah, if you're just going to wait and see, you're always going to be in response mode. And response mode is, is not a great mode to be in, especially in something that has this style trajectory. Because what you'll end up doing is just fighting fires or I take it that 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 type of response, it would probably cost you more in just responding to the problems than it would be if you were a proactive and trying to develop ways of incorporating it. Even for myself, I think in the end, once we have AI with guardrails, Absolutely, students should use it. I think it's the best personalized tutor any one person can have, not just a student. I think any one person. I've taught myself several different things on YouTube, how to repair things in my house or anything that I need to repair. I go and I YouTube it first. And I really think in the future, you'll you'll have an AI assistant that's personal to you that will help you solve that problem. So I think 
it's building the trust with it. I think you got to work with it to build the trust. And then secondly, I think it's how you can make massive impact on the things that you're doing. And I say that from, even from an educational standpoint, I question from a testing perspective, memorization is not how we produce a skilled workforce anymore, right? That's not, intelligence is not necessarily, it's a commodity now, right? And so teaching kids or teaching a workforce how to operate when your first line workers are now knowledge workers. Think of the impact of that, right? So for the first time in history, every frontline worker can now be do knowledge level worker work. I think that's crazy. I heard Sasha Nadella uh, tell that in a podcast that he was in. And I was like, you know, that's, that's amazing to think of when we, in education, we still talk about memorization and remember these things. And what does that look like for a future workforce? I, and I don't have all those answers. But what I do know is you can't be reactive to that notion, right? That's something you've got to be proactive with. Absolutely. So when you kind of picture the skills and values and mindsets that you want to be an important part of for your graduates and what you're nurturing amongst them, and not even just the students, but the adults as well, what are some of those things in these early stages that you are saying, wow, these are really important skills and mindsets we want to be able to nurture and make that a focus of what we nurture? Yeah, I think the first thing is the humanity of us, of who we are. I think that's First, I hate the term soft skills. I, f- I feel like we need to come up with something different for that. But when you think about how students today, how they communicate, collaborate, all those pieces, it's all digitally. We even They even talk differently, right? So we use mediums now. Uh, we talk in emojis or GIFs or other mediums. Even conversation is different. And the notion of conversation is different. And so... I don't know what we could call that, but I feel like there's a mixture of digital literacy and a mixture of soft skills that are together that formulate something that has high regard in no matter what practice that you're in post leaving school, whether that's going straight to the workforce, going into some post-secondary education or certification. I think those are first needed. I think secondly, it's an ability to adapt, right? And it's understanding that the work that you do today is going to look very different in the next five years, 10 years. When I think about what I said just before of frontline workers would be able to do knowledge level work or work, that's something that has to shift and change within organizations. And I think that will take time because it's shifting responsibility. It's shifting even how we look at paying people and what their needs are. And so I think those things take a little bit longer. But in the end, I I find it exciting because there'll be more people contributing to just higher level activities than we've ever had before in a workforce. As you think about navigating all of these things compared with all of the, you know, bureaucracies and standardizations and just like our traditional practices. How does that feel leading in this time? And what are some of the things you do to strengthen your mindset towards taking that risk and not being someone who's reactive and more proactive? Man, I I think it's a lot of reading. I love to read. And if you see any of my posts, I, I read a ton of books. I think it there's this natural need to stay on top of where we're at, both generationally, I think. Uh, if you've read that book, Generations by Janet Twain, just one of my favorite books. And it highlights that technology influences individualism. And so it's, it wasn't pandemics, it wasn't wars. It was all about technology in the beginning, even from the golden era, right? All the way up to what we have now. Why you see where our society is at is based upon individualism. And I feel like when I look at my kids that are engaged in esports, who they identify completely differently. They can be their own avatar. They can be whatever they want. They communicate differently. It really acknowledges that. And I, I think for myself, it's being someone who's a Gen Xer trying to understand. I have three daughters, 26, 24, and 21. And uh, I don't understand them and they don't understand me generationally. But 
understanding how technology has changed their life. I can only imagine what it will be like in the following generations now that our, we're intimate with AI, right? Like I equate this as the Netscape Navigator moment of internet, right? That was the first time that society became intimate with the internet was when the browser came out, right? 1994. So when I think about AI and large language models, this is like our moment, not the AI wasn't here before it was, right? But we didn't intimately interact with it in the way that I think we will in the future. I think we can all agree that response mode is not a great mode to be in. And while AI may feel overwhelming, maybe you're not even sure where to begin, or maybe you have a strategy and you want to think about what's next. Design thinking is a method that can help you move your ideas to impact in just a few days. One of the things that I particularly like about design thinking is that it's evidence-based. There are so many stories of organizations who have leveraged this strategy to create a culture of practical innovation across their organization. But above all, design thinking is particularly helpful when we are dealing with very ambiguous and complex tasks or problems such as things like AI in education, which isn't really a problem, but, you know, is like, oh my God, what am I going to do with this? And it's very overwhelming for many people to even think through, especially when it's moving as fast as it is. So what design thinking really allows for is you to be able to test and validate things in small steps before launching large scale solutions that you then might have to backtrack from. I've been doing design thinking workshops with organizations for the past decade. And then the last one year, the popularity of these workshops has skyrocketed rocketed. I always say come for AI, but stay for design thinking. These workshops really help organizations move from awareness to action and to really building a strategic plan where they can take all the ideas they have, they can take the possibilities they're thinking about and really turn them into impact step by step by step, which is really what allows you to shape the future today. We cannot plan for the next five years. It really has to be sort of these small steps that we take along the way on this journey alongside this technology. And if you're wondering how can so much be accomplished in such a short amount of time, well, it's a very special blend of very structured exercises that we facilitate and, of course, the integration of AI as a member of the team. One of the things that has truly shocked me has been to see how workshops that used to take us three months now take us three days. Once teams begin to feel confident with the technology, we're able to really identify use cases, which ultimately lead to, like I shared earlier, a culture of practical innovation where we're really solving people's problems and frustrations, but also unlocking opportunities that people had just once wished they could do. At Designing Schools, we've been working with counties, businesses, and school districts across the country. I want to share one example with you today from Orange County Department of Education. Now, as someone who grew up in Orange County, it's been so inspiring to partner with them to define their vision for what AI means to accelerate the goals and outcomes they have for everyone in Orange County. Their intentional, responsive, and community-based approach allowed us to bring together all school leadership teams across our county to meet monthly as together we plan, learn, and share how to design schools in the age of AI. Here's Deputy Superintendent Dr. Ramon Miramontes and Dr. Sonia Yamas, Associate Superintendent of Orange County, sharing their vision. Hello, I'm Ramon Miramontes, the Deputy Superintendent for Instructional Services at the Orange County Department of Education. Hi, I'm Sonia Yamas. I'm the Associate Superintendent of Educational Services for the Orange County Department of Education. What I believe the future of education holds for our students is a multitude of things. I still think that we need to stick to the core curriculum, but at the same time, our technology needs are changing in the world. And I think that we have to stay, education has to stay in stride with technology. So it's greatly important for all of us to convene as a multidisciplinary cross-functional team. It's extremely important for a myriad of reasons. When you think about a cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary perspective, it encapsulates various stakeholders, uh, educational partners into the threads of what we're trying to design for our students. And so 
The County of Orange right now is working on a collaborative effort to make sure that our county office that supports school districts has one mission and vision, that's preparing students to be college and career readiness. Education is changing as we know it, minute by minute, second by second. We need to ensure that our students are prepared for the future, and we need to be well-equipped as the adults serving to guide that learning for our students in Orange County. I think for us as the county, uh, the collective efforts, the common vision, the common goals, the common communication, that cascading communication from one department to the other is seamless. And, that, and that's gotta be important. Right? We can't have one part of the county saying something different from the other. So right now we're working collectively to make sure that we have one common mission and that's to support our students. Now that's the vision from a leadership perspective. Here's what the implementation and experience with design thinking feels like from an educator perspective. Today was the first day that I heard about design thinking, so it's a new concept for me. Um, I just loved that design thinking is really about shifting a mindset, and so it's not really about adding another thing for teachers to do, but it's really more about shifting the way that you approach just learning in general, not only for yourself, but for your students. Um, and so I'm really, I'm really inspired by it, actually. I think it's definitely been a difficult year uh, school-wise uh, with our students. And so I think that this is a good way to think, um, you know, in terms of the empathy that she spoke about. This is something that I think is really important for teachers to remember and for us to teach our students. So I, I just love the whole process. Imagine if everyone in your organization felt this way. One of my favorite books is The Song of Significance by Seth Godin. And in that book, he asks, what would your day be like today if you had the best job ever? It's a question that he asked 10,000 people across 90 countries. And here are the top four responses he received. Number one, I surprised myself with what I could accomplish. Number two, I could work independently. Number three, the team built something important. And number four, people treated me with respect. As we think about building and designing the future of work with AI, I want you to think about what would it be like if everyone in your organization felt like they had the best job ever? I asked Rob how he approached AI literacy in his organization when we had 10,000 employees so that people felt like they had the best job ever. Yeah, so I remember, uh, I'll start with this story. I was at a conference and and my superintendent and assistants and deputy soup were at a different conference altogether. And so I got this text that said, hey, do you know anything about GPT? And I was like, and this was in like October. And I said, yeah, yeah. You know, we have this bot that's in Teams that does our, our uh, first service. It kind of looks over our knowledge base and use GPT to answer back like a bot, right? And that was before large language models came out. Wasn't that great at responding? It was mediocre. So they were like, oh my gosh, it's the end of education. That was basically their response. And they were at this conference that was talking about large language models coming out. And so then November comes around. I've, I've had access to ChatGPT. I've done a couple of things. And by that January, I'd used it so often and so often in district leadership team meetings actively and taught some of them even in a training of what to do and what not to do. Because at that time, like data privacy, you were like, ooh, all right. So we need to identify some things you shouldn't do. Once you go into this parking lot, realize there's some things you shouldn't do in this parking lot. And uh, utilizing student data in that is one of them. And it wasn't until we got access to being enterprise chat later that we could utilize student data, right? So that there was a whole practice and then change of practice that happened midway. And it's only because these tools are changing so quickly. So by January, we were training all secondary staff, uh, going to all of our staff meetings, training teachers, and you see them all at different pinnacles, right? You've got the teacher that's like, I show a lesson. Hey, create me a lesson for sixth graders around rain and erosion and make it add activities we could do outside. Boom, like blow people's minds, right? They're like, oh my gosh, I could totally use this and use this often. And then those same people or some different ones are like, wait, kids could have access to this and they could just answer all my questions. And oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Like the sky is falling. And then they come back up realizing that, you know, the sky is not falling. 
everything's fine. And so we did those meetings all the way through uh, May. And over the summertime, we had uh, our tech summit where we highlighted and pinpointed on AI. By that time, being Enterprise Chat had come out and we had deployed it district-wide. And it allows us to have a protected space to where they could start using student data. And so I would say for myself, it's been a learning process. And even helping these teachers understand the process of how fast it changes. I've never seen a tool that has added features and changed as fast as this has. Like, it's hard for me to understand that it's been just a year. No, absolutely. So let's talk, guys. I feel like we've very loosely thrown about the word bring enterprise and all of this. Let's break that down for people. If you could tell us a little bit about what was your setup like before and how, like, did that help you? What were some of the steps that you took to making that decision about being enterprise? Because the one thing I do see as a challenge for a lot of people is really being able to reevaluate, are we using the right tools? And it's it's hard because you're probably, I mean, people identify themselves as schools by the name of a corporation. I am a Google school. I am a, this, like, you know, I hear that all the time. So for people who are very entrenched in a system like that, what advice do you have and how did you make that decision and go through that process? I think for myself, it was understanding. So we had been teaching OpenAI's model for a while and allowing our Microsoft login to give them credentials into it. I think for myself, being Enterprise Chat allowed me... So what the nice thing about being Enterprise Chat is in the session, everything stays. But the moment you clear the session, that data is gone. It's never trained on the model. It's also based upon uh, GPT-4. We are a huge Microsoft shop. I've been on their educational advisory board since 2015. So uh, we were able, we've been in their TAP program. So we worked on, whenever I was in Omaha Public Schools, we worked on Teams before Teams was even released. We, you know, even today, we work on a couple of things that aren't released. So we were able to uh, enable being Enterprise Chat throughout our entire tenant for all of our teachers and staff. Um, that was sometime over the summertime. I remember it took like three days for us to get it propagated because uh, we have so many people. And uh, then practice changes, right? Because I can say, if you see protected, which is in the banner, and if you see it right above your bubble, then you know that you can use student data. You can reference student data. Don't have to worry about the privacy policy from the previous process that we had in Chat GPT. Because in Chat GPT, you could clear the history and it wouldn't be used to model, to train the model. But it's such a thing where if you don't remember, and I think it just makes it very clean for our staff because they're all at digital literacy levels that are different than obviously mine or any of my staff. So it's making sure you're meeting them where they're at and say, hey, here's a safety guard net that you can use and not have to worry. I love that. So what does the workflow look like then for say like a group of teachers who are maybe planning lessons or, you know, somebody like yourself who's like working on a strategy? Are you, do you guys have a workflow system for saving these things, like working with these things? Like what does that look like for you? Yeah. So I have a entire digital literacy and citizenship staff. There's seven of them. We uh, create some templates for teachers and have a shared template model that they can start with. Cause I think Uh, Going into some of your questions around prompting, like there's a certain level of prompting process in order to get the right outputs that you want. And I think for myself, it's getting them there quicker. And if we can do that by creating some different strategies or just different critiques to help them, I launched uh, those different uh, information mechanisms and by what the tech newsletter send out once a month. There's a whole different spreadsheet just about every month with different prompts to help teachers create things very quickly. Because as a teacher, they're not going to use the technology unless it saves them time. And if they don't know how to do the prompting, it's not going to save them time. If there's one theme that Rob keeps bringing us back to, it's asking the right questions. He reminds me of a quote I share when leading AI workshops and discussing prompting practices. It's a quote by Don Norman, where he says, a brilliant solution to the wrong problem is worse than no solution at all. So solve the right problem. What sets apart the power of a good prompt compared to a bad prompt is the question that you ask. And the question that you ask really depends on the problem you're trying to solve or the idea you want to execute on. Now, one of the practices that we teach in our workshops is to prompt the human 
before we prompt the machine. I call this the SPARK framework. SPARK stands for reflecting on the situation. Give us a little bit of info in your context. What's the problem or barrier standing in your way? What are your aspirations? Why does solving this problem matter to you? And what does success look like? Next, you want to share the results. What outcomes are you looking for? And last but not least, we have K, Kismet, which is where you go in and ask ChatGPT for ideas and to also give you some insight into anything you might be missing or something else you should consider to be successful. Now, the easiest way to think about Spark and having that prompt conversation is by thinking about being in a coffee shop with your friend. You know, when you go in and you're like, oh my God, this is, what it's, this is what's going on. You're like sharing your situation. Then you're sharing the problem or the barrier standing in your way. Then you share your aspirations. Why does this matter? Like, I want this because, and then what are the results that you're actually looking for? And last but not least, like I said, you take all that information, put it into ChatGPT and ask it, what ideas do you have? And again, is there anything else I should consider or be thinking about? If you want to learn more about how to bring Spark to your organization so that everyone is advancing their use of AI, solving problems and unlocking opportunity, I'll share a link in the show notes where you can book a call with me to learn more. I ask Rob, After a year of teaching AI literacy, what are some of his prompting best practices and how has that helped him create guidelines for his organization? You know, I think it's making sure that you are setting the, what I would call a persona, defining a persona for you as a teacher and what your values are. Because I think that's what's important from a teacher to a student standpoint is that relationship. And If you can define that persona based upon who you are as a person and what you're teaching, what your interests are, many times what I tell people is like, save that to a Word document somewhere and just reuse that prompt whenever you want to get something back that seems authentic to you. I would say that's that's the biggest piece. Even have like a a spreadsheet or something that you have different prompts for different uh, mechanisms. I have one that helps me create my food for the week, uh, what I'm going to eat. And so, yeah, I think there's all different kinds of ways that you can make things easier, right? This is why I knew you were the right person. I love that you just use the word values as we think about what it is we want to do. It's truly the number one missing piece, I think, from so many conversations. So let me use that then as a transition because you also were somebody who talked about policy. So now that you have this kind of, you're thinking about it, you said you've changed it twice. What was that relationship like for you between thinking about your values and a policy? And then what what were some of the main aspects of a policy you think people should think about? I think the main aspects of the policy is creating the guardrails, right, of where you want to be at. But I also think it should, I think policy should be enablers. It shouldn't just be this, no, you can't, no, you can't, this is prohibited, you know, all that uh, jargon. I really think, and especially in our policy that we've got out, it's, giving a little bit of voice and choice to a teacher to say, you know what, in the future, if you identify that kids can use AI, then here's how you need to list it out in your criteria. And it only needs to be for that particular lesson and that. But giving the right processes for a teacher to be able to utilize AI in a classroom with students, because I think that's the next thing, right? We're all, we've set it up for staff and being enterprise chat allows us to have staff uh, utilize it. They they don't allow BEC to be for students yet, but at some point that's going to come. And how do we allow that to happen? We know kids are likely getting access to AI and other forms. Like this uh, laptop I have back here in the back has LM Studio. So I have a large language model locally on there, which uh, I just love to test out a local large language model just to see how it responds differently than something that I have as a tool set. So yeah, I think it's helping us to get to what's next, right? Which I think is just about everybody accessing AI in some way. No, absolutely. And that's why I love how you're like going on this journey with the technology, because like, I feel like people who are not going on the journey with the technology are going to like wake up one day in just a completely different world. And I I, like, I really don't know how you're going to like respond in that. To your point, it's going to be very reactive. But one of the things I am curious about, a lot of people talk about like, oh, there, there is sort of like this rush to get it into the hands of students. Were there certain tools as you were going through this journey with your staff and kind of working through these pieces? Were there certain applications that you opened up to students? Like, how did you approach this from a student perspective? 
we use Comigo in the district, which is uh, an AI component. It's like a tutor on the right on the right hand side of the bar. You can. What I love about it, it has the right guardrails in place, and I think more tools. I think AI with engaging with kids are going to be more like that, in tune with the content and the tools that are being showed to them at the time. Because I, I think the things that I love about it is you can't answer anything outside of the lesson, right? It's gonna it'll steer you right back. It won't give you the answer. But it's that tutor. And I think for a student, like that's huge. If I were to say, thinking about learning loss coming from COVID, I mean, you realize that 91% of the school districts in the nation became one to one because of COVID. So the number of school districts across the nation, boom, 91% now. Every student has access to a personal computing device. The power of that is amazing, right? I think when we think about intentionality, it's if I had something on that was right next to me all the time, because by going one-to-one, you just expanded the classroom boundaries, right? Both time and space are different. I can learn just about anywhere, right? I can work on my homework just about anywhere. And if I've got something there that may not be a person, because I might not have the social skills to go back and forth with someone that I don't know. But if it's just, and I, I really have learned this from being overseeing esports and all this, if that tool is intuitive enough, that kid will engage with that tool a ton. And I really think having those just in time moments of help is where kids need. We've seen the disruption that 2023 brought with it as we entered our first year with generative AI tools becoming mainstream. How ready do you feel for 2024? If the thought of what we're going to see with AI has you feeling overwhelmed, believe me when I say you are not alone. However, there are practices that we can incorporate now to help us journey alongside these changes. Through reading and learning, we can unlock so much about what is coming next. And to support you, we have a guide where we have curated our favorite books, podcasts, videos that you can go in so that you can either catch up or get a head start on what's coming next. I also have a course called the AI Bootcamp, where we help everyone discover their human advantage in the age of AI. It's self-paced. You can do it individually, or you can bring it to your organization and do it as a team. We share experiences, use cases, and of course, we make sure everyone is up to date with the latest trends and information on AI. If you're interested, I'll drop a link to that in the show notes for you as well. I asked Rob to share his advice for people going into 2024. What are two questions you should be asking? I would say, number one, it's helping them to understand, one, I can create content that I could never have created before and very quickly. And I could get to depth, right? So I could even create things that assess the content that I'm creating. So I can create it. I can create things that assess it. Uh, Number three, I can analyze and be informed of the data that's coming out of that, which is very different than before. I think those three things for teachers are huge. Like those are big time sucks for all of our teachers out there. And if you were to ask any teacher today, like what is the one thing you wish you had more of is time. I think for me, if I can help them with those three things, then they can have more time to create relationships with students within the classroom. Really, I love that. So as leadership teams think about 2024, what two questions do you want to see people asking that you don't really see happening right now? Mm, man, what two questions do I want to see? How flexible are you in your ability to give freedom to staff in their workings with AI? I think that's a big piece of it. I'm still trying to get my policy approved, right? And that takes some time. And I think it's, you're going to have to take a little bit of risk. Like what, what's your level of risk taking that you're able to do with your staff to allow them to succeed? And I think it's a, a different mindset than what I've ever, from any other tool that I've ever had, because it, we've not had the trajectory that we've had with this. I would say number two, how are you looking at the other areas of uh, operational technology, OT, right? And 
thinking of utilizing AI in. So I'll be posting an AI position in February that will look at start to analyzing a GPT model that will connect to, we have Azure Data Lake is where our all of our data resides and helping us to create a model that's local in our in our Azure instance that helps us to start to become informed even on our own data, right? Whether that's people data, student data, logistics data, financial data, uh, all of those together or apart. Design thinking helps with both risk-taking and adaptability. It truly is a method and a mindset that can be your unique human advantage in an AI world. Now, if you're interested in learning more about design thinking and how you can use it as an approach to integrating AI in your organization, you'll find a link in the show notes to where you can book a call with me to discuss this further. Now, if you're not following Rob on LinkedIn, I highly recommend you do so because one of the things that I absolutely enjoy the most are the books and quotes and ideas that he is always so generously sharing. So I ask Rob, if you had to pick a few, which ones would you recommend to us and why? If I were to say that the top things that I do to keep up would be, I constantly look at YouTube and follow some podcasts. Uh, I look at things from Sam Altman anytime he's somewhere talking about AI. Even looking at uh, some videos on, I think Grok just came out from Elon and, and that team on AI. I think it's interesting to see the back and forth, right? This competition is what's creating our disruption, right? And that back and forth. And I think it's important to understand both because like one leapfrogs the other. Uh, a tool that I used last month was Perplexity. And I still use it uh, today, but since then, ChatGPT just leapfrogged it, right? With all and creating your own GPT and doing your other things. From a book standpoint, I love the book Age of AI by uh, Eric Schmidt, Henry Kissinger. That's an amazing book that kind of outlines like validation of this moment of AI. I think it's I think it's incredible. Yeah, I would say those two, and if I were to say a third, it's really getting in and and just learning the tools yourself and working back and forth with them. From my standpoint, it's understanding there's some limits to the number of data based upon the number of tokens in a large language model. And if you don't understand those fundamental pieces, you're going to get really frustrated sometimes because you might either have a large data set that you're trying to have it analyze or a long conversation that you end up running out of uh, prompt tokens. And I think for myself, understanding the right tool to use for the right function is important today. I don't know that I could say that in the future because I think that they'll all reach parity at some point. But this disruption is happening so quickly and the, and the tools and how they work are, are changing so frequently that I think you've got to have your hands in a couple different tool sets. Well, this conversation is going to be a gift, like a holiday gift to so many people. You were so concise and just have such a such a reassuring approach. And I just think people are going to really, really enjoy listening to this. Anything else you'd like to leave us with? P- things people can look forward to from you or anything else you'd like to share before we go? Yeah, we're about to have an article that will be published by Microsoft on being enterprise chat here pretty soon. I'm pretty excited about that. And then we're filming a commercial this week with Microsoft. So um, highlighting Education Imagine Academy, which is my virtual school that I oversee. It's a Microsoft showcase school. So um, yeah, I'm excited about the opportunities that AI will bring our students. I think about that kindergarten student, man, I can't wait to see what their life is going to be like when they're a senior. Like my niece and nephew, but thank you so much for being here. This was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. It's your turn to join the conversation by sharing what you enjoyed or what questions you have. In a world where time and attention are so valuable, thank you for choosing to listen and for being a part of our Designing Schools community. Leaving a review for the podcast helps others learn about the show, giving them the gift of knowledge and allowing this community to help create access and exposure to ideas and opportunities others may not even know exist.